Content warning. This podcast is intended for a mature audience. Contains graphic descriptions of violence and explicit language. Hello, you're listening to Pods of the Multiverse Season 4. We're playing 5th Edition D&D, and I'm Jimmy, the DM for our game in Eberron. Joining me are three of my best friends. I'm Andy. I am playing the Warforged Green Warden, named the Green Warden. And, <laughs> well, after a, a really, 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 really long time buried, uh, surrounded by the corpses of his dead brethren, he's just... Really glad to see some living, breathing faces. The bar is low for what's going to make Warden happy, <laughs> probably. <laughs> My name is Jeppy. I play Alfonso, the gnome artificer, who is... I'm sorry, Alfonso who? Uh, excusatemi, Alfonso Carlucci Roccatella, who is very good at riding the lift. <laughs> <laughs> And yes, the hand gestures are in the uh, oh, the, the yeah. spelling and pronunciation of the name. <laughs> yeah, you have to. All the hand gestures are there. I'm Scala. I play Istvan of Clan Gunvald, a dwarven blacksmith, who wants to know, are you a friendly rock monster? <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorite lines. Anyway, here's episode two. Hell yeah. Last time, we were introduced to Istvan of Clan Gunvald, a devotee of Anatar, sovereign of the Forge, who seeks to restore their inner flame after misusing its sacred power. And Alfonso Rocatella. Alfonso Carlucci Rocatella. Alfonso Carlucci Rocatella, a wandering tinkerer in search of a way to resurrect his brother, whose soul has been bound to his magical prosthetic arm. They join an expedition team on a quest to the continent of Zendrick, where researchers from Morgrave University, financed by treasure hunting investors, seek powerful arcana among previously undiscovered ancient giant ruins. Upon arriving in the ruined city, Isvan and Alfonso encountered the Green Warden, an ancient guardian made from the elements of nature who found himself at the center of a prophesied cataclysm and awoke thousands of years later, his purpose now unclear. Despite Isvan's apprehensions, Warden agreed to accompany them back to camp in search of answers. The surroundings were familiar at first, but despite not wandering too far from camp, the way back is now completely undetectable. So you're lost in this ruined city. It's midday, the sun is passing directly overhead, and it seems to have burnt a hole through the clouds, and it's just shining right down on you very aggressively. The dragon shards in the sky that you see every night are still faintly visible during the day, and they refract the sunlight, causing an intense glare that seems to come from all directions. The heat and the humidity are stifling. On all sides of you are partially destroyed buildings constructed of huge stone blocks, columns, some of which have fallen, archways and collapsed bridges and walls. Everything is caked with dirt, eroded by thousands of years of wind and vines and moss are everywhere. And this entire place has been reclaimed by nature. There's entire trees growing up out of the cracks between this rubble and these stone pieces. What would you like to do? It is as I said before. The way out is gone from me. There is no need to panic. I think we can find our way through this mess. I think, if I am not mistaken, it is our mantid friend that shall help us. Let us call his name. Hey, Dungeon Master, what is the name again? It's Clacky. You know it's Clacky. Thank you. <laughs> no, see, I like this sort of fourth wall breaking. <laughs> Alfonso <laughs> actually cried out to a deific DM. <laughs> Our friend Clacky. We should call out. Hey, Clacky. Signore Clacky. <laughs> Do I hear anything? Not other than just the gentle breeze in the trees and the <laughs> animal sounds in the distance. It's worth noting that that's probably not Clacky's actual name, but is <laughs> maybe more of a name given to Clacky because of the clacking sounds that they make. Do we know any other name to call him by no okay it's kind of just something that gallant took to just calls him clacky hold on let me take a look at something here right i don't think any of us took survival so this ought to be a good one this will be great perfect cue thank you jeppy go ahead and roll survival (laughs) all of us yeah sure well i hope more than me because i got a six oh that's what i got as well i got a 13 yeah you don't recognize anything around you, which is very strange because when you set off from the camp into this city, you didn't really walk very far. You can almost practically see back to camp from the place where you encountered 
the Great Warden, and now the surroundings are completely unfamiliar. Do you recognize anything here? Does any of these look familiar? Are you talking to me, wee one? I'm as lost as you are. Well, let us survey the scene, eh? I think it would be good. I'd like to roll nature just to see if I can assess if we're walking in circles or if we're just lost. Okay. 19. On a 19, you know for certain that you can't figure out which way is north, south, east, or west just due to the strange nature of this place, the way the light is refracting, and the sun's directly above you. You cannot make heads or tails of this situation at all. You know that for certain on a 19. Do any of you have a, uh, compass? Warden just kind of sits down on the ground, which... Even so, he's still probably much taller than his new companions and just ponders out into the sky at this situation. So you're looking at the sky? Yep. You notice a glimmer in the sky, not unlike the one you saw recently that crashed down to the earth. Roll religion. Odd, wondrous (laughs) star. And a 21. 21, yeah. This glimmering light is actually right at the tip of the claw of the constellation of Bahamut. On a 21, I'll just say right here, Bahamut is the draconic deity of protection and good fortune. Of course. Of course. It's Bahamut. What do you see up in the stars? The mighty claw of Bahamut stirs the sky there. And what exactly does that mean? Well, Alfonso, Bahamut is one of the great dragons. The platinum dragon. Great protector, divine justice of the sky. Ah, I believe. Sorry, it's gonna be the whole no, it's game. Great. Cause you talk so <laughs> fucking slow. <laughs> and soon you're done. <laughs> I believe this is a sign. Ah, then it is simple. We follow the star. It is protect us. No, I think that makes sense. Let us follow the star. Signore Warden, after you. I don't see how that makes sense, but I can't propose a better alternative at the moment. So, (laughs) fine! Let's follow the glimmer of a star. Ah, this shall be fun. Alfonso, have you ever had fun in your life? Well, back in Tervelistas, me and me uh, fratelli, Luciano, my brother, we would have fun all the time. Making armor, talking, making armor was fun. And then we would talk. I like making armor. I like talking. Wandering lost through the woods in oppressive heat is not in the same category of enjoyable activities. Ah, I think you make a fair point. But we do get to talk. That's a fair point to your own. All right, on we go. So you start walking in this direction that Bahamut is pointing, and you come to something of a valley made of ruined walls on either side of you. As we're walking, I would say, tell me... Small folk, what is it that brings you to this place? I have never seen such beings as yourself. I am glad you asked. As I mentioned, my name is Alfonso Carlucci Roccatella. I am from Terra Valistas. I am here as part of the expedition, led by Professore from Mulgrave University. Very esteemed man, very intelligent man. Honor to be a part. But I come here because I am looking. (sighs) Well, you see, and then we'll shove off the side of the cape that is obscuring his arm and say, Back in the war, my brother lost his life and I lost my arm. And now the two are inextricably linked. This here, pointing to the glimmer, this is my brother, Luciano. He lives inside of the arm now. I come here looking for answers, solutions, a way to bring him back. I do not know any places you speak of, but you have lost, brother. This I can relate. The ruins where you found me were in a way the remains of many of my brothers and of you, wanderer Istvan. Istvan stares off into the distance. They stroke their chin solemnly where a beard might have once grown. A seek for a way to restore the purity, the strength of my inner flame, the gift that Anathar gives all living souls. I profaned it, and the only thing that will set it right is a work of great beauty or an act of great valor or death in the attempt of either. I see. 
Warden just looks at the ground and then looks up at this scene in front of us. Perfect. So the ground is mostly rubble, and the scene around you, you are walking through this valley made of these huge stone blocks that most of the other structures in this area are made of. They're sticking out at all different odd angles. They're probably 40 feet tall on either side of you. It's a pretty narrow passageway here. So we're at the base of this valley? What do you mean the base? Are we coming into it at level with the ground or at level with the top of one of the walls? These walls rise up from the ground around you. 40 feet up, okay. And how wide is it at our level and at the peak, would you say? At your level, it's probably about 10 feet wide. It's pretty narrow. And at the peak, not too much wider. You can see the sky pretty clearly. It's not too narrow. And perched atop these walls are these precariously perched huge rocks, decorative structures. At one point, this probably was a very like notable promenade. Would I recognize this at all? Can I make a history or insight check? Yeah, sure. You can make a history check. Cool. It's a 16. On a 16, this is not a place that you have been to firsthand, Mm -hmm. but you've probably seen plenty of places like this over the few years that you've been sort of trapped in this place. I have seen places like this grand promenade. Perhaps something on the other side lies for us to find. Mm. At a glance, not all of that stonework looks secure. I'd go with caution, especially underneath. All right. Yeah. Since you said that, I would say let's call that a stealth check to tread carefully. I will attempt one of those. From all three of you, if you're attempting to walk carefully. Acrobatics could possibly also be applicable here. I'll do acrobatics. I'll engage in some monk shit. That'll be a 17 for me. It shall be a 13. Yeah. Warden sort of looks at the two of them ahead of him in their more agile forms and gives a glance to his giant stone boulder legs and thinks better of it. Very well. Oh, no, you're going to go for it? Holy shit. And with disadvantage, I got a three and a one. Yeah, you did. For a total of zero. (laughs) Zero. (laughs) Dex dump. Yeah, you did. Okay, so as you put your foot down, the rubble underneath your foot shifts. And as you keep walking, this keeps happening. I would stop after two or three steps. Mm, uh, No. Am I like now ankle deep in just fucking rubble? No, 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 you're not ankle deep. But as you walk, you can feel that the ground below you is not quite steady. It's not in place. Okay. I fear this will not bode well. Perhaps another route for me, small ones. In the way that I would use arcane propulsion arm, can I launch my arm at Green Warden for him to hang on to for stabilization? No. Great. (laughs) I would say the same thing. That sounds like a ridiculous thing. He's holding this floating (laughs) robot. I I don't like to say no very often, but that's a big no. (laughs) That thing makes attack rolls. Warden, if you're to wander off on some other path, do you think we'll ever find each other again? What with the curse upon this place? Can I look up at the walls? Can I maybe try and get up above this floor somehow? You could definitely try. I'm going to try and do that instead. <laughs> Take a guidance. Courtesy of Signore Ropetella. Wow. Fucking artificers can need guidance. That's awesome. Cool. I'm going to try that. Yeah, so go ahead and roll an athletics check. Awesome. I can do that. Or maybe not. With the guidance, guidance a D4. That's a 16. On a 16, you are able to... What's your movement speed? 30. Okay. So you're able to climb 15 feet up this 40-foot wall, and you're there. You want to keep climbing? I want to keep trying, yeah. If it seems like this is working, I very slowly take my large rock hands and dig them into this wall and climb my way up. How busted up does the wall look? Pretty busted up. Would I be able to cast Mending to patch up the wall where Green Warden is trying to climb to make it more stable Hmm. and easier to climb? I think that would remove footholds. Yeah, right? If you mend the wall, it's going to be harder to climb. Mm. We'll see what happens. I'm honestly curious. That time I got a 15. Okay, a 15. I'll call that another success. While this is happening, is there any writing on the walls or any markings of any kind? Give me investigation. 
Just a seven. Uh, I don't see anything. No, on a seven, no. You see pretty thick moss on one side, and on the other side, just this bare rock. Alfonso may check later, but right now, Alfonso's focused on his new friend's successful <laughs> climbing. Okay, yeah, so you made it another 15 feet up. We're going to see what happens next. I'm really just giving you an escape hatch from that one and that three on the other roll. <laughs> Third attempt, I got a dirty 20. Wow, yeah. So you are able to pull yourself up onto this ledge. So yeah, you're on top of these huge rock crags and you can see down into the valley where your companions are thank you for your guidance alfonso can i see anything new from up here from up here you can see in all directions it's pretty much the same kind of ruined junk this is a leveled city so i'm just gonna follow along from up here as far as that'll work okay great you continue moving the two of you moving very carefully over the rubble at the bottom of the valley and Warden walking along on top. And after a little while, you come to somewhat of a tunnel formed from rocks that have converged on one another at the end of this valley. The opening looks completely dark. You can see with your dark vision, it's pretty deep. You can't see light on the other end of it. It fades into darkness. And that appears to be the only way forward? Above this tunnel sits the Star of Bahamut. We'll be fine. Let's go. Alfonso will just start walking right in. If I can try and grapple or slide my way down this wall, I will do so. Yeah, that should be pretty easy to do. That would be acrobatics, I suppose. That's fine. That is a 15 minus 1. Yeah, you make it down safely. You land with a heavy thud, which echoes in the valley. Hell yeah. Okay, so here you are at this tunnel. Into the mysterious tunnel it is then. So, you walk into this tunnel. Alfonso, you have dark vision, right? Yes. Warden, you really can't see much of anything. It's completely dark in here. Istvan and Alfonso, you see a chamber has been formed by these rocks that have collapsed and come together on one another. Go ahead and roll perception. Kind of take in this room. Eight. Natural 20. Okay. Yeah, on that natural 20, you can see everything in here. This tunnel continues deeper, so there's a way forward from here. Also in the room with you are two figures, and on that 20, you can immediately tell these two figures are made of stone. People made of stone. Medium-sized humanoids. Do you want to take a closer look at these? Yeah, I think so. Would stone cunning apply to this? You know? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so you can roll history. History. See if you know anything about something like this. Nope, that's only a 10. Okay. On a 10, these are remarkably lifelike statue-looking things, and they appear to be half-orcs dressed in kind of miner's clothing. Okay. What do you see? There do seem to be, like, pieces of them missing. Like, one of them is missing the arm below the elbow, and they do appear to be posed kind of mid-stride. Alfonso Carlucci Roccatella. There weren't any half-orcs on the expedition with us, were there? I do not recall. Were there? There weren't. They were all gnomes and dwarves and one human and one mantis folk. Looks like we're not the only ones who've been poking around this place. Terribly dark. I take out my greatsword and I cast light on it. Okay. Do I recognize these half-orcs? You... Don't know what a half-orc is? Let me put it another way. Would I simply recognize that they look like people I've seen before? Yes. Intruders, I have seen them before. Some years past. And when last you saw them, were they in this petrified state? They were petrified of me, but they were not. Stone. Oh, you're doing a turn of phrase here. Very cute. All right. (laughs) I do not understand your meaning. Well, for a moment, I thought you were claiming that you had petrified them. But then I I realized what you were saying is that they were frightened of you. But you were using the word petrified in sort of a metaphorical sense. You are. Isvan, on your 10 from before, you would know that there are actually a lot of dragon shard mines in Zendrik, and most of them are staffed by half-orc miners. Mm. And there's been definitely an uptick in this in recent years. So these are, without a doubt, half-orc miners who got themselves into some sort of trouble here. More well, recent these days, there's more orcs and half-orcs taking up the mineral extraction trade. I wonder what was so valuable. To them. Anything of interest in these caverns? Dragon shards, mayhap. Alfonso, you can roll insight. 
That is a dirty 20. Okay, yeah. On a dirty 20, they appear to be running. They're frozen here in this running pose as if they just ran into the same tunnel that you did from the same direction. Although looking more carefully, it seems as though they came from where we came from and they were in quite a hurry. Perhaps they were looking for safety. Perhaps they were petrified of our good friend here. Cannot say for certain, but it is no matter. Whatever scared them came from where we came from. It may be best to continue on. Let us continue on. At that moment, from the darker tunnel further into this cavern, you hear growling. Does this something that I might be familiar with? You could roll nature. Cool. That's an 11. An 11. A lot of things growl. Okay. I just hold tight to my great sword. Yep. I draw a couple of hammers. I'll get into my armor. We'll go with infiltrator. Mohammed has led us this far with Kosh. Let us go. So this growling sounds like it's approaching, and as you start to set foot into this tunnel, you see a set of glowing blue eyes coming out of the dark. I'm gonna ready an attack. How narrow is this tunnel, actually? I'm sorry. This tunnel is not very big. Warden would probably have to duck his head down a little bit to get in. A little bit smaller than a typical doorway. Who would have gone first? Because maybe it's best if we just stay in this room then. If Bahamut Star has guided us here, regardless of the growling we hear ahead, we shall be fine. Let's go. I'm just going to walk towards the growling. Okay. I'm going to ready an attack. <laughs> and you see these glowing blue eyes in the darkness. Alfonso, do you look into the blue eyes? I won't look directly into them, but I'll look in the general direction of the eyes and just say, Hello, my name is Alfonso Carlucci Rocatella. Oh boy. You're interrupted by an even louder growl this time. Following behind him, do I see a body or anything attached to these blue eyes? So it's coming into range now, out of the darkness steps. This big reptilian looking monster spikes on it, glowing blue eyes, and it has eight legs, long tail. Ah, could this perhaps be a basilisk? Could it? Why would Alfonso know that? Because he plays a lot of RPG games. Yeah, sure. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think Alfonso would be able to identify a basilisk on sight if he didn't already arrive at that conclusion from all the fucking clues I dropped. (laughs) Literally every possible clue. (laughs) Cool. Roll initiative. (laughs) I wouldn't be able to get off my ready to action, would I? What was your ready to action? Attack it. That's fine. As I see this thing step out, I'm just going to take a swing at it. Okay. That's going to be a 19 to hit. Yeah, 19 definitely hits this thing. With the great sword, that is 11. Okay. Nice big first hit on this thing. It rolled very bad on its initiative. So let's get those, what were those rolls? 17. 11. 13. This thing goes on two. All right. That was Jimmy Dice. It is Jimmy Dice, yeah. Love Jimmy Dice. Alfonso, you're up. Mm -hmm. It hasn't reached me yet, has it? No. Okay, I'm going to do some punch stuff. Does a 17 hit? 17 hits, yeah. So we is 12 lightning damage. We're going to follow it up with another punch stuff. Punching, punches. Another 17 to hit. Okay, great. And that time only an extra seven lightning damage. Okay, seven lightning damage. Okay, so this thing actually has a passive effect here because you are within 30 feet of it right now and you're looking at it because you're attacking it. I always attack with my eyes closed. Alfonso has fate in Bahamut Star. That's not the way it works. Yeah. I'm just kidding. What do I have to do? What save am I going to make to avoid being petrified? As you're trying not to look at this thing while you're attacking it, you do kind of lock eyes with it, and you have to make a constitution saving throw. Natural 20. Okay. For a second, you kind of feel it start to burn into your eyes, and you feel yourself seizing up, and then you break your gaze, and nothing happens. All right. That is Warden's turn. After I swing at this thing... After I see Alfonso engage and get stuck in this glare momentarily, I am going to avert my eye and, (laughs) yeah, fuck it. I'm going to try and attack anyways. So this is with disadvantage. It's still going to be a 15. 15 just hits. Hit this thing's natural armor. Go. That is a 15. 15. You're beating the hell out of this thing. It is extremely hurt now, and it's roaring out in pain. Away, monstrous beast. Go for it, Ismon. Okay, so... Wait, doesn't Andy have to make a con save, or is that Wisp? He averted his eyes to attack with disadvantage. Oh, right. 
He said those words. Yes. And I didn't listen. Very nice. Okay. A lot of details. I don't know. I'm not sure if Istvan would know to avert their eyes. I think the appearance of this basilisk would contextualize your 10 from earlier, and that would probably just do it. Say. Okay, cool. Very good. I just wanted to make sure. So I will avert my eyes and I will attempt to throw some hammers. So I'll use a bonus action, activate my Kensei shot. You see the ends of my hammers begin to light up with this red orange, just pulled out of the fire glow. And I'm going to puck them blindly down the corridor. <laughs> okay, that's two tens, 17 to hit. Yeah, that hits. And that's going to be. 11 points of damage, Mm -hmm. and then the second attack. That's all you need. Oh, okay, cool. With that 11, so tell us how you did it. I like that phrase. So I shut my eyes, Autotar, take the wheel! And I (laughs) hug the hammer, and and it cracks right on the bridge of the basilisk's nose, and the blue eyes just fade and go dead. I notice that the hissing stops. Is it safe to look? Yeah, this basilisk roars out with one final expression of pain and just falls over with a thud that echoes in this tunnel. And we exit initiative. Very cool. Did you just bop it on the nose like an ill-behaved animal or something? I do not condone ever bopping animals on the nose. Look, sometimes a tunnel critter is gonna run afoul of you. And bop it on the nose was the advice my oldest sibling gave me, so that's what I do. Quite an intelligent family. Uh, I don't know about that. Ping! My hammer rings back to my belt. Let's press on. So as you walk a little further down this tunnel, the light from the outside starts to fade. And you're walking for a little while, just in what would be total darkness, if not for Warden's lit weapon. After you're walking for a while, with your 13 passive perception, Istvan and Alfonso, you come into range of what you hear to be someone talking. It's muffled. It's coming from around at least one corner. You can't quite make out who they are or what they're saying, but you hear talking. You think if you get a little bit closer, maybe do a perception check, you might be able to learn more. I'll move closer. As will I. And I'll try to do so in a surreptitious manner, though we'll see how stealthy I am. 23 stealth check here. 23 stealth is going to get you as close as you want, probably. Okay. Warden stands perfectly still and does not attempt to make a stealth check. I'm going to keep moving closer until I can begin to make out the conversation. Absolutely. And on that 23 stealth check, I'll give you advantage on your perception check. Okay. Because you can get very close. I got a 14 on stealth. I don't know how close that gets me. I would say not as close. Yeah, no shit. (laughs) You're trying, but you're trying very hard. 21 perception. (laughs) My goodness. Yeah. 21 perception. You immediately now can recognize the voice of Rizian, the Kundarak agent who accompanied the expedition. The entire time we've been traveling through this cave, has it been a single tunnel? No, it's sort of a tunnel that's been formed by the collapsing and converging of different structures that fell in on themselves. and It's not a cave and it's not really a constructed tunnel. I would have thought that maybe whoever's down this tunnel let that basilisk loose or something. But if there's been other sort of access points then you haven't seen any other access points little ways that the oh yeah yeah little holes between that a basilisk could fit into but you maybe wouldn't think to yes right right okay rizian is just saying yes good get all of it in the bag don't forget to check over there and you can hear rizian's companions yuli and orlot rummaging around saying like sure boss right away i will make myself known find something interesting down here did ya so rizian turns to face you when you make yourself known, and you can see his unkempt black hair, his drooping black mustache that connects kind of non-committally with his few days of beard growth. He's got these really deep lines on his face. He looks like he hasn't slept in weeks. And he wears a black safari jacket cinched at the waist with a gold Kundarak insignia on the lapel. Oh, it's you. Istvan, was it? I. Oh, you know, the usual. Giant coin, dragon shards... You know, nothing of too much note yet. Anything in the direction you came from? No thing. So is Istvan... Well, we made a friend. <sighs> oh, no. <laughs> if that didn't actually pick up on the mic, Istvan face bombs hard as Alfonso says this. <laughs> okay, so... Alfonso is walking up, coming into view out of the darkness. There was a basilisk back there. We killed it. Have you seen any? Basilisks? No. Yes. Terrible eyes. But you killed it? I thought you said you made a friend. It was a clever turn of phrase. Turn of phrase is a funny thing, usually. 
Uh, gnomes always think they're so clever. You guys have another six seconds before I start walking in. This new room that we've come up in that these dwarves are looting, does it look like there are other ways out of it, or does this look like the end of this passage? Give me a perception check. Okay, sure. A 13. Yeah, on a 13, you definitely see that up ahead, there's a little bit of natural daylight coming in, and they probably came in that way. You can see that his companions, Yuli and Orlot, are moving stones out of the way, digging through this rubble and putting different sorts of things that they're finding into their bags of holding as you're having this conversation with Rizian. Mm -hmm. You haven't had any trouble finding your way back to camp, have you? I haven't tried yet. You can't find your way back? No, it's this blasted curse. Ah, yes. The Traveler's Curse. So you are familiar. Then why are we sent alone? You weren't supposed to wander off that far. But nobody told us. We didn't wander off that far. You can stay with us if you like. We'll be heading back before too long. In Signore Clacky? Sure, he's around somewhere. Interessante. He's fun. What do you think? We were looking for our party, huh? Seems as though we found it. I don't like it. You don't like much, do you? <laughs> oh, yes. No! Oh. A gnome. That is what you are. What was that? This is our friend. Our other friend. Out of this small corridor, you see hunched over one hand first, then the other, and he pulls himself all the way into this room and stands fully erect, some seven feet tall. Hello there. Rizian immediately draws a saber and brandishes it at you. Relax. Ah, Signore, Signore, uh, it is good. This is our friend. The other friend, not so much friend. This is good friend. This is friend that becomes familiar over time. This is your friend? See, si. His name is Green Warden. He likes to be called Signore Warden. He lowers his blade. True? He asks you, Warden. I do not lower my glowing greatsword, and I simply nod with my large stone helm. Rizian looks back to Istvan and says, That looks like a... Very valuable find. Why didn't you tell me sooner? I say this in Dwarvish. He's not a find. He's his own being. He thinks that Croswell can help him find whatever his purpose is, and we told him we'd take him. But he's not to go back to Corvair unless he wants to, of his own volition. Rizian kind of scoffs. His own volition? Istvan, constructs don't have volition. Does he say this in common or in Dwarvish? It's in Dwarvish. I nodded that. I would have thought not. This one does. Or acts in such a way that it is indistinguishable from consciousness. And I think that deserves some measure of respect. Don't you? Well, we'll just have to see about that. Even though I don't understand their language, can I make some sort of insight check as the demeanor of their conversation? Yeah, you can make an insight check. Sick. I got a 21 insight. On a 21 insight, you can tell they're definitely talking about you. Istvan might be trying to hide it a little bit, but Rizian absolutely is not. He's gesturing towards you. He's talking about you. You there. I point my greatsword as it's glowing at Rizian. What is your name? Rizian, Costas Rizian. You speak in a language I do not know. Tell me, what is it? That would be the language of the dwarves. Dwarven? Dwarves. And you are of the same expedition as my new allies? It would seem that way, yes. Very well. I turn my greatsword over and plant it the ground. Just stand there. You see, he waits for orders. Oh, God, I fucking hate Rizian. Does he say that in common? Yeah, that was in common. I pull the greatsword out of the ground, and I lean forward, pointing it directly at Rizian. Rizian takes a step back. You, I do not understand half of the words you have said, but I can understand that though you are so small, you speak down to everyone around you. At this point, his companions have kind of taken notice of this situation. They've stopped what they're doing, and they're looking in this direction. This from when I come from, that is not wise. He takes another step back, and he looks back to Istvan one more time. And in Dwarven once more, whether you like it or not, you've found something very valuable here. And he turns around, gestures to his companions, and they walk out the other end of the cave. A moment after they've gone, I turn back to Warden. As he left, he said to me, 
we have found something valuable, some thing of value. And sentient being or no, that is how House Kundarak sees all people and all objects in this world only in terms of what monetary gain they can provide. You don't think that perhaps he was referring to the value of friendship? What do you mean by the words monetary? Allow me to explain. <laughs> I'm gonna stick to this fucking character. <laughs> I wanted to play King Kong, goddammit, I'm gonna play King Kong. <laughs> Monetario is suggest money. Are you familiar? Ah, no, I see. No problem. Okay, money is a thing we use to... Ah, this is harder than I thought. So, if uh, you want something you like, yeah, you see something... You know. Commodity production is... <laughs> <laughs> to fucking explain economics to a boulder. <laughs> economics are determined by commodity production, but to create a stable medium of exchange, there is introduced... A third commodity between the exchange of two independent commodities, and this is the money commodity. Uh, you can read all about it in Marx's Capital, part one. I sort of scratch at my stone head. But why not just own the means of production? <laughs> that is the goal, after all. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but here's the question. There's still, like, monarchies in Corvair, so we haven't really progressed beyond feudalism for capitalism to sort of assert itself. Let's do a stop and save, because this does, has no reason to be recorded. This is the best content we've ever recorded. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we do record it then. Kind of the whole premise of Eberron is that, yes, there are these five kingdoms, but then there's also this proclamation that sets these 12 dragon-marked houses as independent entities from the kingdom. And so they become international, autonomous, not really ruled by any one kingdom or another. And so they have control over the markets in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And so we have kind of progressed from feudalism into something more resembling like the Renaissance. There's definitely economic stimulus happening beyond just the ownership of feudal land. And also, I think Istvan would, because of their background in House Kunderak, just kind of have a natural understanding of that economic structure, uh, <laughs> even despite this whole, like, monastic lifestyle they have and their faith and all. They still are very ingrained, sort of the way gold makes the world go around. Yeah. So other than the way we came in and the way they went out, is there any other ingress, egress in this cavern? Do you have a current perception check that's outstanding a 13 yeah on a 13 you can see that there are smaller tunnels that warden was noting earlier that smaller creatures could traverse these tunnels quickly and easily but as far as you guys walking through this tunnel now it's pretty much just those two ways well there is no use going back the way we came let's go i will follow okay signore warden i would not worry about your new friendship with signore Rizian. many great friendships get off to rocky beginnings eh uh, pardon no pun intended my kind ward against giants alfonso i am not afraid of one small man badass very great okay cool let's go so you walk towards this light and you see just like the way you came in and opening to the outside it's a little bit later in the day now early afternoon does it look more or less the same as far as surroundings yeah pretty much it's more open now you can pick a direction and as soon as you walk out of this tunnel you get your bearings because of this claw of bahamut in the sky it still shines onward if you want to roll religion again that's another 21. And on a 21, you definitely can see for sure. Strangely, this glimmer in the sky doesn't seem to be in the same place relative to the entire sky. Mm. But it's still part of the constellation of Bahamut, and it's still pointing you in a direction. And on a 21, I'll just tell you that Bahamut is pointing out the way, which in a place like this might not always be in one steady direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to follow that. Yeah, everyone give me a perception check as you step outside. Five. Nine. Seventeen. Same types of surroundings, these ruined structures. On your 17, you can see that there is something moving in a nearby destroyed crag of stone. And on that 17, as you're looking at it, you can tell it's looking back at you, but you can't tell what it is. Looking through a little opening between some rocks. You ready? 
Something's out there. Oh, who goes there? It doesn't respond. It's staring at you intently. Its eyes are not glowing. I'm still holding my sword. I start moving towards it, cautiously, but not in a hostile manner. What do you see? There's something watching us, but I can't tell anything about it. It didn't seem to respond when I called out to it, but doesn't seem hostile either so far. Well, some things are more shy than others. It just takes a good bit of reassurance. Alfonso's going to start walking up to it. Hello, friend. What are you exactly? Okay, so then all three of you are looking at this thing in this direction. And as that happens, a another creature, Jimmy dices its way up behind you with a horrible stealth roll. Oh, man. <laughs> and, <laughs> nice. <laughs> and you can see just in plain daylight something. It was trying to sneak up on you, but this is an owl bear. Roll initiative. Okay. I like how many of these little fucking dweeby encounters there are. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. 18. Uh, 21. Mm. Nat 1 plus 3 is 4. Okay. Wow. Jimmy diced that, too. <laughs> it's really kind of sad. All right. So Owlbear 1 and Owlbear 2, the one that you were approaching is 1, and the one that is coming up, that tried to come up behind you, is 2. But I'll refer to them differently in the actual combat. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So, uh, yeah, there's no surprise round because it totally fumbled the stealth roll, and that's Istvan up first. Okay, and these owl bears do seem hostile. They are hunting in a pair right now. Okay, Sick. cool. If anyone wants to roll nature, you might know a little bit about that. 17. Dirty 20. On a dirty 20, you would recognize this. You've seen owl bears before. They're not super uncommon in a place that's magically weird as this. Cool. And they do hunt in pairs. Owl bears. They appear to be hunting you. They appear to be hunting us. Remember, we are friends now. We travel together. No matter. Let us dispatch them. This is basically a bear with an owl's face. Very cute. It's awesome. <laughs> they are kind of cute. They'd be pretty cute if it wasn't like screeching out a horrifying hunting call. Well, here's a question. Do their heads rotate? More than 180 degrees. We don't like need to answer owl. that. We don't need to answer that. I mean, on a 20, I think you know that they would. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Very important. I need to know this. All right, I'm going to throw hammers at it because that's what I do. I'm going to bonus action use my Kensei shot. My hammers start to glow as I pull them off of my belt. And I huck two of them at the owl bear that just came out of the woods and tried to ambush us. Okay. Okay, so the first attack is a 17. That hits. Okay, and that is going to be 11 points of bludgeoning damage. And the second attack was a 10, which isn't going to hit, I'm guessing. 10 is not going to hit. Low DC, but not that low. (laughs) I thought as much. They aren't in melee range with us yet, right? You were approaching it, but it's still kind of behind these rocks. It's still in total cover. Okay. In that case, I'm going to use my movement just to move away from where these owl bears are so they can't charge up on me. Yeah, I'm just going to move 35 feet away from these owl bears. Warden. After seeing Isfan chuck some hammers, I'm going to turn around. I assume it's pretty close to me, and I'm going to try and hit it with my greatsword. It's within your movement, so you approach and hit? Yes. It's going to be a 19. Yeah, that hits. And I'm going to reroll that one because I remembered now that I have great weapon. Great weapon as my fighting style. And that is going to be a 14 total. Mm -hmm. And that's my turn. Okay. Both of you landing these hits on this thing. It's starting to look a little hurt, but it's very angry now. And it is going to really try to take you down. It stood up on its back legs and screeched up into the sky. And it stands nearly 10 feet tall and fully stretched out like that. Cool. Oh, mamma mia. So the one that is in hiding is going to pop out from behind the rocks, and Alfonso is the closest to it, and Alfonso looks like some pretty tasty prey for an owl bear, and it is going to hmm, beak him. Oh, no. 18 to hit. Oh, man, yeah, that makes sense. Armor is weak against beak, so yeah, that hit. <laughs> and that's 14 piercing damage. Are you shitting from a fucking beak? <laughs> Yeah, it beat it's you. five times your size. Everything's five times my size. <laughs> yes, this is large. <laughs> All right, this one makes another attack. The one that was previously hidden makes a claw attack now on Alfonso. It really wants to eat Alfonso, and it's going to hit probably with 26. As I said, they are hunting you. <laughs> Watch <laughs> out. It appears you're correct. Today is not a good day for making new friends, huh? Oh, that's 
Better than Clork has ever rolled 2d8. That's 19 slashing damage. Jeffy's upset. This thing beaks you in the head and then grabs you by the shoulders with its claws and digs in, drawing blood. Okay. This does not feel good. I expected this to go a little bit differently, eh? Welcome to Eberron. Is it my turn? It is your turn. I would like it if both of you got away from me. Immediately. I will cast Thunder Wave. Both of them make a con save. Warden's also in that range. It's fine. I don't care. Warden's taking it. Alfonso is <laughs> survival mode. So much for friendship, huh? If I got a 17. That'll do it. One rolls a 10, the other rolls a 6. Beautiful. All right. They're both taking 10 thunder damage, and they're both getting pushed 10 feet away if anyone wants to make an AOO. Do I take half of that or not? Yes, you do. So that's 10 from each of them. Yeah, I'll swing out at the one that's moving away from me. I get a 19 again. That hits. We roll that one. That is a 11. Yeah, this thing is looking very hurt. As Alfonso blasts it back, you swipe out at it with your sword. But it's still fighting. Is that Alfonso's turn? Yeah, that's all I got for now. So this owl bear, it's really big. It's got an owl's face, so it sort of almost acts more like a bird than a mammal. Its eyes are darting around. It looks at Warden, weighs the danger of attacking Warden, and then realizes why it's here. It's not going to eat Warden. It's going to run after Istvan. Okay. It has a speed of 40, yeah, so it's going to run right up to Istvan. And I'm going to do the old beak and claws. Like, I know we're not using a map here, but... If I moved 35 away and it was pushed 10 away, would I be right out of its range or is it just different? That's a great point. Thank you. No, that's good rules adjudication. You're right. You probably are at this point 45 feet away from it. It's going for Alfonso. Great. It looks at the distance. It kind of sizes it up and thinks, I can't make that distance of this turn. I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm I'm glad. I'm glad this is... This is great. I immediately regret my decision. Alfonso needs a reality check as a monster looks at Isfan and Isfan just scans the area and then points at Alfonso. And then the monster's like, you're right. Let me go after that. <laughs> <laughs> nice friend. It screeches and moves in towards you with a 23 to hit. Yeah. Does that Jimmy. hit, Jeppy? Okay. Don't ask. Just do it. Just do the damage. Just that one. Go ahead. More reverse Jimmy dice. Give me him. It's a 48 damage. These are a lot of reverse Jimmy dices on these damage rolls. This is 11 piercing damage from the beak. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Alfonso's looking quite wounded. And it's got some claws, too. Perfect. Yeah, battered. Real tossed around. This one's going to miss with an 11? Yeah, good. Okay. Now they're both teaming up on Alfonso. One looking very hurt and one looking barely hurt. And we're back at the top of the order with Istvan. Okay, so I'm going to go after the hurt one. I'm going to chuck two hammers at it first and then see what happens. Well, a 10 misses, but a 24 hits. 24 hits. Or excuse me, 23. Still hits. It's going to take... Five points of bludgeoning damage, and then I'm going to run up to it, and I'm going to spend a key point to make a flurry of blows. Okay, so it's going to be a 14 and a 19 to hit. Both hit. Okay, I'm going to run up to it, and I'm going to hop on top of it, and I'm going to try and choke hold it. This is against the more hurt one, right? Yeah, this is against the more hurt one. I'm pretty sure with just modifiers, you're going to take this thing down. So if you want to go ahead and describe how you're doing it. Okay, cool. Basically, I think you see what I'm getting at. I'm going to run up behind it, get on top of it, do the thing where I turn its head more than 180 degrees so that it's (laughs) looking at me, and then just keep going and break its neck like that. Jesus. Um, It's going to be a total of 18 points of bludgeoning damage. Yeah. So you turn its head all the way around, and with a sickening crack, the life just leaves its body suddenly and collapses. Yeah. And you're just on top of this thing now. It's lifeless body. It was a cool move. Just, I think I made the description very sad. Anyway. Yeah. No, no, it's cool. <laughs> That's Warden. Okay. I'm going to move towards the remaining owlbear. I'm going to invoke my boreal sweep, one of my sorcerer abilities. So I'm going to dash towards this owlbear. You see icy shards and spectral bits of water and mist around my form as these dull glyphs begin to glow on my body, activated by this dragon shard, and the owlbear as I approach it needs to make a strength save. Okay. It's a 13. Cool. That will fail, and it is not prone. Falls over. And I'm gonna attack it with advantage. Go ahead. That's an at 20. (laughs) Nice! (laughs) Not even kidding. All right. And uh, you know what? Seeing Alfonso as injured as he is, I'm going to go ahead and use a smite. Alfonso, 
I am coming, uh, friend. That was a bunch of dice. It's not even all the deeds. Two more deeds. 22 slashing and 14 radiant. Holy shit. Okay. As I swing down with a burst of radiant energy. Yeah, you land this devastating blow on this creature that's lying down, and you crush a big part of its body. Uh, it's looking extremely hurt. Still up, though. Well, not up. It's laying down, but still alive. That's its turn. It's going to get up, and it's going to turn its attention towards Istvan now, who just felled its hunting partner. And it's going to give him the old beacon claws. That's a 24 to hit. Yeah, that hits. Eight piercing damage, okay. followed up by a miss with 11. Okay. That's Alfonso. Yeah, I'm going to bonus action disengage. You can't do that. Yeah, That's no. That's right. Thing. I keep saying, okay, you can't do that. Yeah. You can action disengage. No. I'm going to go for it with disadvantage. 18 on number one. Okay. What are you taking disadvantage Why of? is it with disadvantage? Because it's the lightning launcher and the creature is in melee. Yeah, and then a 15 on the other. So that was a 15 with disadvantage? With disadvantage. That hits. Sweet! 11 lightning damage. Okay, to use this phrase that Andy uses all the time, it's on death's door. Let us kick him out the door. Shall we? <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, uh, I'll try one more. No, no, uh, five is not going to do it. It is not going to do it. So Alfonso readies the lightning launcher, and it just whiffs past it and comes back and snaps back into place. My good friends, you will have to take care of this. I am severely wounded. I am very tired. Please, please help us spell this foul creature. Your lightning launcher lashes out, hits a nearby mossy rock, and then returns. We're back to the top of the order with this fun. Did somebody say kick? <laughs> Yes. It would be more effective if I used my weapons, but did somebody say kick? I'm a monk. I got a kick. You only need to do two damage. Okay, so a 22 hits. Uh-huh. So I'm going to do nine points of bludgeoning damage as I leap off the body of this one owlbear and do a two-footed drop kick onto the head of yes. the other one. 100% of yes. Yeah, and this thing screeches out one final death rattle of a screech and then completely chokes and dies. Oh man, kill descriptions as a monk are the funnest thing. <laughs> but kill descriptions from Jimmy are always sad and bleak. <laughs> this thing's family watches as it just no longer has life and it just struggles for a while. And then falls limp. Three baby owl bears climb out of the nearby <laughs> rocks and tug on their mom's ear. Oh my ear. god! <laughs> no, that doesn't happen. That happens off screen later. That happens after <laughs> we walk away. You've perpetuated a needless cycle of violence. <laughs> Regret your choices. Oh this uh, owl bear family is going to be hunting you for revenge. This is the campaign now. <laughs> I love that. All right. So we exit initiative, and something very strange happens. Something strange is happening. Bahamut saw us kill two innocent owl bears and has forsaken us. Hey, you killed him in self-defense. Bahamut would commune with Lendis, who's the draconic deity of law and justice. Bahamut, yeah, Bahamut, Bahamut, Bahamut. I can't believe that's what they went with. Jesus. What? Bahamut. In 14, that's how all of the voice actors pronounce it, and it's absurd. Yeah, I looked up the pronunciation for this because I knew I was going to be saying it a few times, and I saw Bahamut, and I was like, no. No. Uh -huh. Why no. did I even look it We're up? I'm just going to say yeah. Bahamut. <laughs> so dumb. Yeah, Bahamut will commune with Lendis to determine that, yes, this was self-defense. They will not be held accountable for it in the afterlife. So something very strange happens here. The mossy stone that your lightning launcher hit is smoldering ooh, trembling if anyone would like to attempt to do something about that yeah i'm gonna check that out maybe give it a nature or arcana check either one cool they're the same that's 30, another 20. nat 20 okay on a nat 20 plus what plus four on a nat 20 plus four and a dirty 20 you would not be unfamiliar with this concept that sometimes when lightning strikes strange things can happen your your lightning launcher has done something to the stone. The moss on this stone is starting to grow very large. It's now completely engulfed the stone, and it's growing and growing, starting to encroach on your space. Do I think on that roll that this might turn hostile? Should we try and get away from it? On your 24, you can't possibly roll higher, so. We should leave this 
place. And I should no longer use lightning? This will be difficult. I hope you understand. Perhaps just with caution, friend Alfonso. Ah. And I begin pushing him away from this rock. And I'll also take that chance to use some lay on hands on Alfonso. You regain 10 hit points. Yeah, I'm going to move away from this rapidly growing moss as well. Thank you very much, Signore Warden. And no worries. I am very cautious at all times, after all. This thing is growing bigger and bigger. It opens up like it has this big maw and it's moving. Moving very slowly towards you. Perhaps shambling would be a word to describe how it's moving. Did Alfonso just fucking lightning a shambling mound into existence? Yeah. <laughs> fucking cool. Um, but it's very slow and you can get away with no problem. So you make your way away. Can I check the ground for prints from Rizian and crew? It's weird that they're not nearby. I would still be steering us towards this star. I wouldn't. I mean, you can roll an investigation check. 18. Yeah, on an 18, you do see some sets of footprints, probably matching the types of boots that Rizian was wearing, and they are heading in the direction where Bahamut was pointing. I was mostly curious as a player, but good. Great. Okay, yeah. So after you get away from this shambling mound, you walk for a little while, turn a corner and come across a clearing, almost, where the wreckage isn't quite as dense, a field of rubble, and standing there in the field of rubble, is Rizian and his two companions, as well as Professor Croswell and his two research assistants. They haven't seen you yet as you round this corner. They're standing in this clearing, conversing. Can we hear what they're saying? Yeah, and just in broad strokes, they really don't know the way back. Are both of Rizian's crew dwarves? Yes. So all three of them are dwarves. Croswell is a gnome? Yes, and all three of the Morgrave people are gnomes. Three dwarves, three gnomes. Cool. And then Gallant is a human. All right. Yeah, so they're sort of arguing about which way it is back to camp. More allies of yours? Yes, this is the professor I was telling you about. Very smart man, a signore Croswell. He's from Morgrave University in the city of Sharn, in case you have not heard of it. Very nice place. You very large. keep saying these words, and I do not know of what you speak. But isn't that very exciting? That means you get to learn. What a gift, huh? All right. If none of you are trying to evade being noticed, they're going to notice you now. It is now time for them to notice you. Yes. (laughs) Jimmy says, looking at his watch, it is time. So one of Croswell's research assistants, his name is Lanlin, he takes notice of you. That's right. Alfonso is going to wave. Yeah. He sees Alfonso waving and he rolls his eyes and goes, oh, great. Hello. Professore. There you are. We were just wondering where you got off to. We kind of wonder the same. We seem to have gone in circles for quite some time. What would the traveler's curse? Are you in the same predicament? Yeah, Lanlin says, I can't believe that's your accent. You really talk like that all the time? Yeah, the traveler's curse. Is he saying that to Alfonso? Yeah, he does say that. That's first order of business. He's just taken aback by how ridiculous your voice is for a gnome. As I have mentioned, it is different for a gnome growing up near elves in the city of Tervalistas. This is kind of what happens. There aren't many of us, you see, but of the Interrupting exist- Alfonso, the Green Warden <laughs> strides from behind the corner. The three of them who haven't seen you yet completely stop what they're saying and just go, what is that? So we have Croswell, we have Lanlin, and we have Zinni. Zinni will say, did you find that? What is that? I am a green warden of this place. She looks with like a panicked face to Professor Croswell. One of these ancient giant constructs. Marvelous and remarkably well preserved. I was not made by giants. I fought against them. So, Warden, as you approached this group, the ground below you is shifting as you walk with your heavy Mm. rock feet displacing some of these rocks, almost as if this ground is not stable. Okay. I just sort of take note of that and quietly pause my movement. Yeah. And on your passive perception, the other two, you can feel Warden's footsteps as he walks. You know, you're outside. That's kind of a weird feeling. He's big, but he's not that big. This place is full of dangers. There, and I point to the star. We should follow if we hope to escape. And what is that? Croswell asks. That is Bahamut guiding us. 
He looks to his two assistants. The Hobbit. So as you're standing here having this conversation, the ground below you shifts in a way that everyone feels, and you sort of have to steady yourself on your feet. We should leave this place. Now that's the best idea I've heard all day. And the group of people begin to walk, but as all of these people move together, start stepping on these rocks, the ground below you starts to give way. Everybody make a dexterity saving throw. Can I cast mending on the ground? <laughs> Mending takes a minute. Okay. We got a minute, right? No. Okay. Okay. It's a 21. 18 for me. I got a three. No. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I've got a trick. Me too. It's mending. Here, let me roll for everyone else. Okay. So, wow. All three of the dwarves save and all three of the gnomes fail. <laughs> so, <laughs> Isvan, Alfonso, Rizian, Orlot, and Yuli all jump to safety. Warden and these three gnomes fall with these rocks into this deep pit. Taking, if I can do this, I don't know how quick all of this is happening. If it looks like we're going to fall pretty far, I'm going to cast Misty Step. I feel like that would be a reaction. Yeah, that's why I bring it up, because Misty Step is technically a bonus action, so it's a few. Yeah, I would say specifically, in a situation like that, you'd be able to cast a reaction spell. I think a bonus action's not quick enough there. So you're going to fall into this pit with all of these rocks. Oh no, I hope I don't squish the gnomes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thankfully, you land on top of the rocks, as do they. Okay. Okay. And everyone takes 10 bludgeoning damage as you land on this bed of rocks. My new companions, are you all right? Maybe. Very well. What just happened to Green Warden is almost like crowd surfing, technically. Do you see anything down there? Roll perception. You can roll perception from the top, too. How far down are we, did you say? Not too far down, probably about 20, 25 feet. And give me your perception check, though, before. I got a dirty 20. Yeah, on a dirty 20, the rocks have fallen away where you probably could climb out relatively easily and assist the smaller folk in doing that as well. There are two tunnels heading off of this chamber that you've fallen into. It appears you've fallen into a room of a buried building of some kind. There are tunnels beneath this ruined place. I, of all places, got a nat 20 here, so for a total of 21. Yeah, you can see the same thing. That extra one's not giving you anything. <laughs> Great. Makes you feel <laughs> Sorry, even better Jeffy. about the nat 20. <sighs> I'm just going to jump down there. I'll use my slow fall to take no damage. Do you have to use a resource for that? No, it's just something you can do as a monk. Okay, then that's fine. But you probably could also climb down without hurting yourself if you rolled something. Yes, but I choose to leap dramatically. Right, because you're a monk. <laughs> yeah, of course. If I jump, can Green Warden catch me and I avoid damage? You literally just said you can climb down harmlessly. <laughs> I want to jump and have my friend catch me. Yeah, so it's going to be <laughs> Alfonso roll acrobatics and Warden <laughs> roll, I don't know. Also acrobatics. This is going to go poorly. Yeah, it's kind of like trapeze shit. So yeah. Roll hand wisp coordination. I do have half health, but it's worth it. I want to build friendship. All right. I got a 19 on the dice. 22. I got a six. Minus one. That's a five. Miyamichi, catch me, please. I don't. Yeah, so you say that. You don't even give him a chance to react, really, before you just jump down onto him. sort of him. slowly <laughs> move my yeah. giant arms up. You're fine. He'll take half your fall damage. <laughs> he puts his hands out, but because he goes too late, I land on his actual palm of his hand, and he takes damage from having his hand stepped on. Yeah, you take five bludgeoning damage, Warden. <laughs> Was this your intended outcome? Well, I thought it would be nice to test our bonds. I feel this friendship is growing, but I am sorry. Perhaps not fast enough. We will save jumping and catching for later. <laughs> mm, very well. Alfonso, I wasn't trying to encourage you when I jumped. It's just something I've been trained to do. I hope you didn't feel like you had to follow me because I did that. I don't want to put you in undue danger. I don't throw hammers because I watch you throw hammers. I want to do jump. Rizian looks down at everyone who's now in this pit. If it's all the same to you, we're going to stay up here. I know this will hurt him. So when he says that, I call back. Great, more treasure for us. Oh, I was going to say, and then uh, at the same time, Alfonso waves up the bag of holding. Then find the keeper, is that? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. Just remember who you work for. And then he turns and leaves. As they're squabbling, can I look down one of these hallways? You rolled a 20 before. Just let it roll. On that 20, you can see that off of this chamber that you're in are not very deep tunnels that open up into rooms in either direction. And you can't tell what's really in these rooms without heading down one of these paths. These 
tunnels are archways. These are doorways that are giant sized. This is a giant building and these are rooms in a giant building. The remains of the giants civilization. Small folk, you know the curse of this land. I would not think that the treasure of these ruins would be so easily taken. Anyone doing anything? Looking at these archways, does there appear to be any text on them? No. And if there ever was, it would have been worn away long ago. Okay. It does look pretty well preserved for something that is that old, but it's been underground for a very long time. Structurally, it's still intact, but little details like that are no longer here. Be partial to left or right, I say to no one in particular. Can I see which direction the sky and star and everything were pointing from down here? Yeah, so you're looking straight up out of this pit. You can still see it. And and you know, to borrow a phrase from Andromedy, I've always been partial to left. Let's go left. Cool. I say that. I look up at the sky. I look down. Nah, for some reason, I have always been partial to left. You also said a grand line earlier that I meant to point out. You said, I don't understand half the things you say. Yep. Did that on purpose. (laughs) Yeah, that was good. That was from like this week's episode. Okay, yeah. So you walk into a very large room. There aren't really any decorations or adornments. They've been long since worn away. But there is a huge stone table close to 10 feet off the ground. Does it look like there's anything moving in this room? No, you don't see anything moving in this room. You can tell from the ground there's some stuff on this table. You can't see what it is. I'm going to try and jump up on it. 10 feet vertical leap. I'm going to try. All right. I'll get a running start if I can and give it a shot. That's a dirty 20 athletics. Okay. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, so you're able to grab this ledge, sort of monk shit your way up on top of this, and you see on this table a bunch of stuff sort of a treasure hall so we have let's do some rolling here 26 giant gold coins they have the face of a giant on them they're about dinner plate size made of gold you have 59 gold worth of eberron dragon shard and a big jug with some kind of liquid in it i'm going to smell it cautiously okay this will probably be an arcana check i am not proficient in that but i will attempt anyway 19 and a 19 You don't need to be proficient in Arcana to recognize Healing Potion. (laughs) The formula, probably known since ancient times, relatively unchanged. Okay, how big is this jug? This is a jug that's probably almost your height, being kind of a diminutive creature. Right. And it has six potions of healing in this one huge jug. Okay. I'll call down. Have any of you researchers any flasks upon you? Yes, why? There's a restorative elixir in this here jug. Also some valuables. I'll divvy those up accordingly. All right. Good. So you do that? Uh, Yeah. How are you going to get these things down off this big table? I take it the gold is sturdy enough. I can just toss that stuff down, right? Yeah, that's easy enough. I do a little math, take my cut of the gold, put it in my bag of holding and push the rest off the table, do the same with the dragon shards, and then I suppose I would try and see if I could get some vials handed up to me so I could extract the healing potion. 59 gold of Eberron dragon shard is probably five pounds. It's almost like crushed ice size gems, what a giant might regard as a powder. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Very cool. As they're doing that, if this is taking a minute, I sort of turn to Alfonso and say, You are still quite hurt. You should sit and rest. And it's not a very bad idea after all. Yeah, I'll take a short rest. Yeah, you're here long enough for a short rest. I shall rest with you. Go for it. Mm, second. Okay. I'm a little hurt too. Now I'm not. 44 out of 53. Not bad. Eight. Okay, nice. I rolled 2d8 and got eight on both. Heal for 16, I'll take it. I'm also going to use a font of magic to get back one of those spell slots. And once this is all done, I will leap off the table. Again, I can slow fall and not take any damage. Very cool. Well done, Distvan. Your display of acrobatics is wondrous. Did you know that the original healing potion recipe actually comes from ancient times? And so this healing potion that you've come across, preserved for tens of thousands of years, is not unlike one that you could buy in any corner store today, Croswell says. My. 
I look somewhat perplexed towards the warden. These little numbers work just as well on inorganic beings as they do on us flesh and blood ones. I may be made of stone and vine, but make no mistake, these rocks can be made. I am as much a part of this earth, this organic world as elf or dwarf or giant or no. I meant no offense, just curious. And I took none. That's it for that room. While we're taking our rest, I'll definitely look around and see any other ways out of here. There's no other ways out of this room here, and there's not too many other features in this room at all. Maybe as if someone had already looted this, maybe some other time, maybe it's been inhabited by creatures. And if we went down another hall, it would be going away from the star? Yeah. I think it unwise to go away from our guiding star. Perhaps return to the surface we should. I don't think that is a bad idea. Since you did such a good job helping me down... Perhaps you can help me back up. I just start walking towards the hole. <laughs> so, Warden, you walk back to the first room that you fell into. Have the stars changed, or are they still pointing the same way? Interesting question. Would we even be able to tell? I mean, we're just looking at stars in the sky. You'd be able to tell if the star was in the same spot relative to where you're facing. Yeah, that's true. You know what? Fuck it. The star is now pointing you towards that other room. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Now you're taking advantage of the DM screen. <laughs> this is what happens when you don't have an Andromeda in the party. Strange. Very well. I begin moving towards this other hallway. So you're not going to help me up. Okay, let's go here then. All right. Come, friend Alfonso. The course has changed. Alfonso will saunter on following... The green word. One eight billionth of his size. I just want to scoop him up, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> what did you roll for height, Alfonso? I'm actually curious now. Did he roll height? I rolled height. I'm four foot two. I just wrote the word very short in my character. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I get garden gnome gnome from Alfonso, you know? Just like <laughs> foot tall. Oh, uh, not a foot but no, maybe no, no, three no. right like but instead of one of those cone hats i got one of those floppy venetian ones right love it all right so you walk into this other room okay you see a room that's very similar to the one you were just in it's sort of the mirror image of it you take in the details of this room almost as if this structure was above ground at one point there's windows that were filled in with dirt there's really no other egress from this space but it is full of strange constructions, things built of metal and stone and wood and not anything recognizable. I mean, maybe there's like a couple of huge bows, you know, nothing usable by you. But if you want to look around for something that's not immediately apparent, you can go ahead and do that. Yeah, I'm going to absolutely do that. I will simply look to see if anything, again, is moving or presents as a threat. On investigation, can I use yeah, that? absolutely. 18. And I got a 14 perception. Okay, on your 14 perception, you don't see anything presenting a threat in this room. And on your 18 investigation, you find all the treasure that I put in this room. Principally, you find three items. A big scroll of thick vellum. You find a fine dust in a covered pot. And you find a large, green, mysterious gem. It's like a cut jewel. It's probably the size of Alfonso's head. Mi amici, my friends, come here. Look at this. I slowly approach. Not as interested in the scroll of vellum or the pot of dust. We'll take those items and try to like pass them off to the Green Warden and Istvan and whomever else may be nearby. And we'll just hold this gem. And can I roll Arcana to see what this thing's about? Perhaps. Even before you roll Arcana, as soon as you pick up this gem and hold it, you feel just this immense feeling of confidence. You feel very competent. Okay. Would I be able to recognize this as another dragon shard? It's green. This is not any dragon shard any of you have seen. Hmm? Shit, I'll roll Arcana. I'm definitely rolling Arcana. Take a look at these things. This, this, however, this feels different. This is Luciano. No offense, but this is like Luciano times a billion. I like this. <laughs> Whatever this is, I like. Uh-oh. Luciano clenches his fist. <laughs> Aww. Uh, yes, it's a 17. I got a dirty 20. Wow, yeah, on a 17 and a dirty 20. Well, Alfonso, you can definitely tell 
that this confidence that you're feeling is a magical effect emanating from the jewel. But I'm not going to give you Identify for free. You do feel like, though, if you were to try something, anything, right now, you'd probably be a little better at it. I'm casting Identify. Oh, you have Identify. I do have Identify, and I'm going to cast it. And I'm going to cast the shit out of it, because I'm feeling real confident about my cast. (laughs) I identify the shit out of this green thing. I look at it, and then I know what it is, because the DM tells me in a second. (laughs) Amazing. Okay, yeah, so this is a mysterious gem. While it's on your person, so if it's in your pack, if it's in a bag of holding, if you're holding it, doesn't matter. If it's on your person, it gives you a plus one to all ability checks during the day. At night, it's minus one. Whoa. While it's on my person, which should be easy because it's the size of my fucking head, apparently. Okay. This thing feels great, but upon further review, I realize that it may not be so beneficial at nighttime. But Alfonso, if you haven't noticed, he liked to play with fire and tempt fate. With the star of Bahamut above us, even at night I feel good. I shall keep this, unless any of you object. As Alfonso is identifying this stone, I'll take a look at the other things he found. For the scroll, I'll just roll over Alfonso's 17 arcana check from before. This is a spell scroll. It's written in giant. Oh, Croswell's with you. Croswell identifies it as spider climb scroll. This other covered pot with dust, it's sort of this very fine gray dust. Do you want to do anything with it or about it? Or I guess I'll examine it without touching it. Try and just look at it, smell it, see if that gives me any information. It has no smell whatsoever. Hmm, okay. See, Scala has some idea of one of the dusts that this might be. But I don't think Istvan would know. I could roll Arcana or something if it's relevant. You could. If you really knock it out of the park, I'll... Okay. No, I don't. Yeah, no, this is very much a session two dust. Mm, It's really... Yes. Yeah. This is the dust that we found in this room. That's right. So what is that? Is that uh, sand from a nearby beach, perhaps? I'll try and see if it looks familiar to me at all. It's far finer than sand. I got a one. On a one? No. You can't even figure out how to open the pot. No one has a bad feeling. We can just take it with us. Perhaps it will make itself known over time. Or we leave it here. It is just dust. Uh, You're the one who found it. Said it might be worth something. Yeah. I found my gem. I am happy. All right. So the party kind of comes back together. Lanlin and Zinni finish throwing whatever stuff into their bag that they found on the other side of the room. Do you leave this chamber now? Is there any other way out? No other egress. All right, cool. We found the stuff. Let's go. Yeah, you found the stuff. This was just a big treasure room at the end of the dungeon. Signore Warden, perhaps now it is time to help me up, huh? Perhaps. Grazie mille. And he'll run off to the opening. So you go back into this room where the rocks collapsed. And looking up, it's starting to look a little bit darker now. It's not solidly daytime anymore. It's starting to become evening. Alfonso, you start to feel a little less confident. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to put this gemstone to use. I feel like the winds will shift for Alfonso shortly. Let's make haste, eh? Signore Warden, I'm ready to jump. Why are you doing this? Because it's fun. <laughs> the best reason to do anything. Because it's fun. Because Jeffy's a fucking jackass. (laughs) (laughs) But at least he's using his powers of jackassery for good instead of evil now. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Very, uh... Lighthearted jest instead of dickish, rude antics. It's either net neutral or additive, not uh, subtractive to our adventure. I just sort of look at this gaggle of small folk and I'm like... Happened? Where did you end up? Where did you go wrong? (laughs) (laughs) I have seen the way this place has begun to prey on you, friends. Perhaps it would be safer if we stayed the night. I'd like to find the others if we can. I still feel well enough to search for a a mite longer, but I don't want to leave anyone lost to this jungle. Clutching the gem. Ah. I would agree with my good friend Istvan. I think there is a little bit of light left for us to seize. We should take advantage of it. Even if we only find their bodies. Very well. Warden, roll nature. I roll nature as I pick up Alfonso in both hands. Getting a 13. Yeah, on a 13, you know for sure. There's probably about two hours left of what you would consider daytime. Okay. Before it would be very much dark out. Seeing Alfonso's deep, deep eagerness, I will, as a gesture of friendship, toss Alfonso up. Let it happen. Let the friendship happen. It's going to be athletics from Warden and acrobatics from Alfonso. (laughs) 
Oh no. Oh, no. Did we have a nat one situation? <laughs> I got a nat twenty. Oh you got a nat oh. twenty. <laughs> Warden throws Alfonso so far and Alfonso Fucking, is You're missing. going to the moon, bud. <laughs> the rest of the campaign is gone. <laughs> I got a thirteen to acrobatics. Very nice. If I may, shot put style, I retract <laughs> my arm all the way back towards my face. And spring-loaded action, I catapult him directly (laughs) into the air. Amazing. Amazing. So, Warden, you launch Alfonso out of this hole. And Alfonso, you feel an immense force. Reminds you of the elevator that knocked you almost on your ass. Oh, I remember the elevator. And you fly up out of this hole and land right in the arms of Chad Gallant. You catch him unawares. He kind of stumbles, puts one foot back as he catches this gnome flying towards him. I sort of get this, like, (laughs) Gaston and what's-his-face? LeFou. LeFou, sort of. Oh, my God. Ah, Signore Gallant, nice to see you again. We were looking for you. And now we found you. Excellent. So Gallant is with Clacky, and the two of them are just making their way towards this big hole, hearing some kind of commotion going on down there. And he says, I was wondering if you make it back alive. Good to see you, too. You say that from down in the hole? Yeah. The rest of them down there? Rizian's still, like, just up here somewhere, hanging out. He didn't go too far. He would start to see... Warden climbing up the side of this hall towards him. Do I see Croswell and Lanlin and Zinni behind me? Yeah. Aye, all accounted for. Somewhat miraculous, given the things we've run into out here. Croswell, Lanlin, and Zinni grab onto Warden, kind of like that scene in The Princess Bride where Andre the Giant climbs the big rope. <laughs> I'll <No>. allow it. <laughs> yeah, I'll... What did you roll? Me? Athletics, that's a 25. Yeah, that beats the marginally higher DC I was giving you for ferrying these gnomes up (laughs) absolutely so now the whole party is together and as warden is climbing up out of this hole gallant drops alfonso on the ground do i need to make a save no he dropped you four feet that's like probably twice my height you can make a save i'm not making a save make a dexterity saving throw no i don't want to god damn it 16 you're fine catch yourself (laughs) glad we did that (laughs) me too so Gallant drops you, and he points and goes, What is that? This is our new friend, Miyamichi, Signore Warden. Green Warden, full name. Clearly you can see he helped us up. A good friend. Long time friend. I was beginning to think that all of the folk of this age were small. It can talk? He looks to Croswell. What is this thing? <laughs> I am the Green He talks, he fights, he helps, he climbs, he jumps, he runs, he does everything. Of his own volition. Again, truly a great friend. Croswell says, This is one of the ancient constructs, probably constructed to fight for the giants, I would imagine. I turn back and look down at Croswell. I draw my sword and I point it at him threateningly and I say, The Green Wardens did not fight for the giants. Giants, we fought against them. They were the evil we tried to undo from this realm. Croswell kind of falls backwards and scuttles behind Isvan. Are we sure this thing is safe? Warden, I don't know how it was in your age, but generally in this age, we don't raise a weapon to someone unless we intend to use it. I stow my sword on my back. Mm, Of course. I understand how you feel. When you're so proficient at violence, it becomes almost a second nature, a reaction to you. These, I clap my hands on my belt full of hammers. These are first and foremost tools. And tools are made to build things. And I stare down into the dirt. At least they're supposed to. Edgy. <laughs> <laughs> it's back. That's right. Get your band-aids, because this stuff cuts. Look, these are blunt weapons. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> this shit bludgeons. Bad puns. They're also back. Well, they never left us. DM, what's going to happen next? Clacky is going to pipe up. 
Clacky clacks his mandibles as he does, and everybody looks. Clacky really has no facial expressions. It's really hard to tell, but Clacky gestures in a direction and begins walking. It will be easier to follow Clacky than it will a star. Let's keep going. Is he heading in the same direction as the star? Yes. Cool. So, no sooner do you set off from this spot, you arrive at camp almost immediately. It was just right there, oddly enough. Now that Clacky's with you, you kind of just turn a corner and here's where you set up camp earlier. Insane. Kind of seems almost silly now that you couldn't find your way back, but you deduced correctly that this is due to the curse, that this area is just not navigable. So when you get back to the camp, where you left a lot of your equipment and supplies earlier, you can see that the light of Bahamut is still up there in the sky, beckoning to you in a particular direction. Bahamut's light still shines ahead. Strange, I have been trapped, warden of that ruin for years. To have reached its edge seems out of fate. It is certainly cause for celebration. Perhaps now we rest. Signore Warden, come with me. This is where I camp. I don't think my tent can fit you, but if you'd like to, sit nearby. You are welcome in my space. <laughs> He's just like, <laughs> here, take my hand. Come look at all this stuff. Oh, my God. <laughs> exactly. Before you walk away, Rizian will pipe up. Hold it right there. Your bag. And he puts out his hand. Well, everything in my bag I found down below where you refused to come with us. I did say finders keepers. Finders keepers being one of the golden rules, at least in Terra Veristas. And I said that you'd be paid fairly for whatever you found. Empty out your bag and let's do this appraisal. I empty the bag, which I presume has the gem in it. Probably only the gem. I don't think I put anything else in it. Unless there were some of the gold coins were doled out. Yeah, there probably would have been nine giant gold coins and 19 or 20 gold pieces worth of dragon shard. These are my things. There are some gold coins, which you can take. I do not know how valuable they are. And the gem, which is worth one gem. I would like to keep it. Well, does this fun? dump out their bag? Yeah, his fun dumps out their bag. They're not looking to start shit right now. Yeah, so everyone dumps out their bags, and you've amassed a pile of artifacts and riches. There's these huge gold, silver, and copper coins the size of dinner plates, big gem-encrusted rings that could fit around your body. There's a huge golden death mask that looks to have a giant's face, and a long wooden pole with gold inlays that Croswell guesses is a wand for a giant artificer. And just all these different wondrous... Things. Rizian is sifting through this pile of stuff, looking for anything of really true value. He puts his hand onto the green gem, and his face falls. I think you can just go ahead and keep that <laughs> as the sun is going down. <laughs> Very good. So yeah, he gathers all the things back up into one big bag and says, you'll be compensated for all of this once we make it back to Stormreach. I wouldn't have put the healing potions in my bag. I would have wanted them to be within easy reach. He wouldn't even notice. Does he collect the weird dust up too? If it was there with all the stuff, then yeah. Yeah, I would have put it in my bag. And then Rizian's eyes turn to Warden. The Warden did not take a bag. Thank you, Alfonso. I wonder how much this is worth. <laughs> Again, he did not take a bag. There should be no value. I'm aware he did not take a bag. I'm also aware he is not a member of this expedition, or possibly even a living thing at all. Professor, this construct is an unprecedented discovery, truly. And Gallant says, we'll all be famous. And Rizian says, we'll all be rich. Well, I don't suppose you'll fit in a bag. We'll figure it out. Eh. The entire time they're talking about me, I'm looking down at them and the light beneath my helm, glancing at one and then the other as they speak. I just think to myself, Perhaps they cannot for my quest. The one that Alfonso alluded to as having quite a lot of knowledge about relics and dragon shards and things. Croswell. As they're talking amongst themselves, I look down and I gesture towards him, non-threateningly. Are you the one they call Professor Croswell? He looks at you, even just with your passive intimidation score, he is horrified. Yes? Alfonso has told me you are a scholar, a wise person. I should like to think so. Good. You see, I am aware I come from a time long ago, a time lost, perhaps, to this world and to your kind. But I seek a purpose, not for any 
monetary gain. Any thing to do with your far-off Corvair. But I seek to know why I have been brought to this time. I seek to know why I have been chosen by Sybaris and Bahamut. Pray tell, Professor Croswell, what is your insight of this? And I slowly take out the Sybaris dragon shard. Astounding. He extends his arms towards the dragon shard. May I? I don't let go of it, but I let him touch it. He touches it with both hands and gazes into it. I've never seen a Sybaris shard so big. Indeed. Look within. And Lanlin and Zinni kind of crowd around it and also look in. Very curious. The draconic script and language were derived from dragon marks by the ancient dragons. Many people don't know. The dragons did not invent the language so much as discover it in the natural pattern. He gazes into it for a while longer, and then he snaps out of it. Where did you get this? It was given to me from above long ago. That is where most Sybaris shards come from. They fall from the sky, but I've never seen one like this before. Rizian says, then surely must also be very valuable. Yes, quite. And I'm sure there are plenty of people who would love to have this item in their personal collection. There's quite a bit more we can learn from it first. I begin stowing it away back under my moss shawl. Alas, then my quest continues. Who do you answer to, Construct? I am a green warden in your brutish choice of words. Not a construct. A construct is that machination devised and built, assembled by the giants. I was given the breath of life by the elves, and they were who we served as legions. Ah, I see. Croswell turns to the group. You see, the elves were the slaves of the giants and actually did a lot of the artifice work that is attributed to the ancient giants. So when this construct here says it was constructed by elves, that must be what it means. Very interesting. I bend down, and from beneath my stone helm, you see the light flare a bit as I look directly in the eye as he says this. Perhaps you are confused, scholar. The Green Warden were given breath just as the stars fall from the sky trees grow from the ground and you populate this later age we came to existence as the draconic prophecy would say as all other life it was Gallant looks around and says, Is anybody else getting hungry? Let's get a fire going. I want to just cut this guy's head off. Istvan has already gotten the fire going. As soon as they're back at camp, it's the first thing they do. Oh, okay. They've probably already, as this is going on, started hammering at some piece they've been working on. So everyone makes their way back to this fire area, eat a simple dinner, either drawing on these rations or whoever might be more of a survivalist in the group might have found something remotely edible here in the jungle. You know, you all sit around this fire. And this argument between Croswell and Gallant and Rizian, this spirited conversation about personhood, the nature of a person, a construct, goes late into the night. Warden, would you be a part of that? I would simply be standing on the periphery, watching them, but also watching very closely the ruins beyond out in the darkness. Zinni is going to ask Warden, do you mind if I draw you? Very well. She takes out a pad and starts sketching this shape of your helm and your natural rocky form. She does a few drawings, you know, with measurements and specifications, and some are a little bit more artistic. I glance over at one of the more artistic ones. I knew many elves skilled in ways of art. They would be delighted to see such a likeness. Would you like one? You 
Honor me, small one. She tears a page out of this book and hands it to you. Yeah, and I very gently fold it and put it beneath my cloak. It's too bad you're not a real Warforged. You could have, like, refrigerator magnet it to yourself. <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> Alfonso, as the sun has set and it's now firmly nighttime, the later it gets, the more this feeling of insecurity creeps in. Gotcha. Istvan, may I have a word with you, please? Hi, Alfonso. Do you need any maintenance done on your armor? I saw those owl bears took some bites out of you. No, it is not that. I just wanted to speak to you. I sort of stop working on this grappling hook that I've been making. I throw it into a pile of grappling hooks. Away from the fire, then? In private would be nice. I thought as much. Yeah, I'll follow you wherever you want to go talk. We'll just go fucking fuck off somewhere. I don't know where we're going to go. Somewhere nearby that's private. Yeah, you find a big stone thing to stand behind. Don't get lost. Don't get lost. <laughs> Roll survival. Oh, gosh. Oh, no. I got a 13. I got a 12. Okay. I think as long as we keep the fire in sight, we can make it back, eh? That sounds great. I agree. Anatar's gift of flame is truly marvelous. Istvan, I'm beginning to worry. Something has shaken me. I think it is more than just a gem, huh? There was something in the way Rizian looked at our new friend. It left me uneasy. There's many things about Rizian that make me uneasy. Perhaps I should have been more cautious and more attentive to your words. I get the feeling that we are very expendable here, and that our new friend is in danger. I came here knowing that I was expendable. I want to be expended, Alfonso. If I am to be, I'll do so doing something worthwhile. And if you and I have the same understanding, I think that'll be protecting that new friend of ours from the clutches of House Gundarak. I am starting to agree. I came here to bring my brother back from the dead. This is where he is. As I said earlier, he's with me, always. But I know Luciano. He would not be very proud to know that I've become indebted to such greed and evil. Luciano would want to help our new friend, and I think that is what we should do. You'll hear no argument from me, but I think for now we should be patient. We don't know what else is going on here, and we can't rightly make our way out of here without getting lost. It's as I said, I don't draw my weapons. Unless I intend to use them, and, well, I'll be ready when the time comes. Alfonso, oh, I have you here. Can I ask you? It may be too personal of a question, but your brother's in your arm. That seems impossible. How did it happen? Most people do not believe me when I say this, and I understand. It's not very easy to hear, not very easy to believe. But, yeah, see, my brother and I, we both worked in Terravalistas, and we were part of the war. One day he was killed. And I lost my arm. When I woke up, this was it. A dear friend of mine, my mentor, she made this possible. Exactly how, I do not know. My mastery is in the ways of the forge, not in such matters of souls. I didn't know the fighting made it all the way to Tervalistus. But we passed through Valinar a few times, my convoy. Our caravan ran from Corunda to Making, running raw materials from out the mountains for the Syrian war effort. But I'd heard Valinar had missed the worst of the fighting. How did you end up in a battle? I have not seen much of the world, but I've seen enough to know that in all of its corners, people find reasons to fight each other. In this instance, my brother and I were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. We were armorers on behalf of the army, and we were swept away in combat. We were not supposed to be there, but we were. Luciano lost everything. It's unfair. War always is. I'm sorry, I hope I didn't pry too much. Uh, my friend, you know I am an oversharer. It's who I am. It's not trouble at all. I hope you know, and I look directly into Alfonso's eyes. Not the same thing exactly, but I've been close enough to where you are to know how you feel. If you ever need to get anything more off your chest, we have an understanding. I appreciate you, mi amici. Walk back to camp. Indeed. All right. As you walk back to camp, Gallant meets you on your feet and says, Oh, there you are. It's getting late. It's going to be about that time. And he hands each of you a... 20-sided die. Time to roll for watches. <laughs> <laughs> Does he hand me one, too? No. Yeah, of course not. Great. He doesn't give one to Clacky, either, because Clacky's not part of the expedition. I rolled a 14. I rolled an 18. You can roll deception check to lie about your roll or sleight of hand to make your roll come out a certain way. But if you get caught, you know, that's on you. So what were those rolls? 18. 14. 1. <laughs> so we sort them of in order. Istvan and Alfonso, you might notice a little tick when Gallant says his number. Should I roll insight on that? You can roll insight, yeah. Nope, nat 1. On your passive insight, you'd notice that. Okay. On a nat 1, I would say you should totally call out your boss on lying to the rest of the group. <laughs> that's something you should definitely do. 
Oh my god. Uh, the dice have decided. On a 17 plus 5, I just pointed him and say, You are not being honest. He kind of looks at the rest of the group. What do you mean? If he didn't say it, I was going to. Everyone else averts their gaze. They don't want to question the leadership. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. So, the three lowest roles are Yuli, Zinni, and, well, Croswell, and then Lanlin steps in and takes Croswell's watch. So, everyone else can sleep through the night. Uh, on my sentry's rest, do I see anything particular or interesting? Warden, where are you going to sleep tonight? I just sort of find a nearby tree... And well, you don't want to sleep near my tent? I showed you it. A tree nearby Alfonso's tent. All right, thank you. And just sit beneath it and take my sentry's rest. I think we said when you're in like this natural setting, you can roll stealth on your sentry's rest to be almost indistinguishable from a rock. That's a 14. Okay, anything you two do before bed? Yeah, Alfonso's feeling really weird. He wants to get some rest. So you set up your tents go to sleep. Warden, while you're out under this tree, being a rock for the night, you hear this conversation between Orlot and Yuli, the two Kundarak associates of Rizian. Roll perception to hear what they're saying. A 13. On a 13, you hear them freely conversing. It's the end of the work day. They're off the clock at this point. They're good buddies. Orlot says, what are you going to do with your share? And Yuli says, I'll probably invest it in the Kundarak account. Live off dividends, retire when I'm 200. What about you? Oh, I was going to buy one of those elemental speedboats. Hey, that thing seems really valuable, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I don't know how we're going to get it in a bag, let alone back to Stormreach. Anything Warden wants to do here overnight? Not really. When he is alone, he's very introspective, thinking about everything that's happened and how he got here and this star and Sybaris and very contemplative. Other than that, so, the sun comes up, it starts getting warmer. Alfonso, you're awakened by the sound of muffled murmuring coming from nearby. Okay, I get out of my tent. I'm going to take a look around. Do I see anything that might be causing this sound? No, it actually seems like you're the first one up. And the sound now seems like it's coming from inside your tent. I'm going to go back in my tent. Is there anything murmuring in my tent? It seems to be coming from your bag. I'm going to open my bag. What's in my bag? As you open up this bag and start rooting around in it, you realize it's this radio that has again turned itself on. You're listening to Radio Civis. I'm Dan Lapisara. King Boronel yesterday announced an informal tentative ceasefire with the nation of Sire. King Boronel said, I believe with the power of love, anything is possible. This comes on the heels of the deadly attack on Sire two nights ago. We turn now to our political analyst, Drexine Volpo. Drexine, thanks, Dan Lop. It's clear King Boronel is deflecting from his failures as a leader. After inheriting the throne from his father last year, the young monarch has yet to exhibit the same force of will that positioned his father as a fearsome combatant for so many decades. Back to you, Dan Lop. So you hear this news report. Oh, brilliant NPR performance. Thank you. Just so, so Very accurate. Nice. Literally NPR. Thank you. Yeah, that's just sort of the morning news, keeping you apprised of what's going on back home. The radio transitions to background music as you get your bearing. As everyone wakes up, exits their tents, this glimmer of Bahamut is still visible in the morning sky, even now that the even now that the Ring of Sybaris has faded into this daytime form where the light's more diffuse, you can still very much see this shining light beckoning you in that direction. Behold the light of Bahamut. Calls. While you're looking up at the sky, you hear from behind you, now, and they rolled really badly on their stealth checks and also kind of gave themselves away by yelling out like this, so we're going to roll initiative, just Warden, and... Hell yeah. What you see is Yuli and Orlot. Okay, I got a 19, minus one, that's still an 18. Okay, yeah, Yuli got a 21, and okay. Orlot got a six. So Yuli is holding this bag of holding and is going to try to put it over your head. I'm going to roll with advantage because Orlot is helping them. This is an attack roll, this is not a save. This is a grapple. Okay, cool. Okay, and that is... Yuli is not quite as strong as Orlot. That is going to be... Holy shit, a 23. <laughs> I got another 19. That's a 24. Yeah, so... Real quick, Andy definitely just anime villain laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so they get this... I'm sorry, 25 athletics. They get this bag over your head very briefly, and you're surrounded by treasure floating all around you <laughs> before you're able to immediately rip it off. And I just, matter of fact, push them off of me and onto the ground. Is this visible from... 
where Alfonso or Esteban would be. After this commotion sort of takes place, you do notice this happening. I'll say at the top of the next round, you guys can roll into initiative if you want to. That's Warden's turn. I sort of look down at them. You have made a mistake. Do not do this again. Or Or what? I will be forced to defend myself. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and cast Mirror Image. You see spectrally blurred copies of myself around my form as all of my runes begin glowing with a white ethereal glow. Very cool. All right. It's Orlot's turn. All right. It wants to do it the hard way. And Orlot is going to draw his battle axe, and he's going to attack. Cool. That's a 23 to hit. Okay. So five. He attacks a duplicate. And one of them vanishes. It's the top of the order, and Gallant emerges from a tent and goes, I knew this would happen. This thing's too dangerous to have around. And he rolls in. At this point, Alfonso's going to run up. Okay, Alfonso, roll in. I also join at initiative 12. Well, my initiative is 14, but I'd like to say... Gallant, what is the meaning of this? Looks like your air quotes. Friend is attacking our companions. You want to do something about it? I think I saw something very differently than what you have just described, Signore Gallant. But yes, we did come here on this expedition with you, so I would like to do something about it. Whenever I'm in initiative, I will attack one of the two attacking Green Warden. Okay, it is Yuli's turn, and Yuli is going to try again to put this bag over your head. Not with advantage this time. It's not going to do it. It's a 14. 21. I just, like, swap them down with my big rock arm. I will not harm you, but you are making this mistake again. It is unwise. That's your turn. I just cry out to Isfan and to Alfonso. I fear your expedition has made an error which I must rectify. I must away. And I am going to cast Misty Step and flee towards the direction of the Bahamut Star. You see, very suddenly, my form turn into dust and pebbles and leaves and tiny branches and twigs and swirl into this wind and whip through the tree. Yeah, and as you disappear, Yuli falls over, having been holding their bag against you. So you flee in this direction that is away from the ruins where you were yesterday, towards this tree line where the expedition emerged. I'm just going to dash with an action and my full movement to get as far away as I can. Which is 30-30, so you're now 90 feet away. Where'd it go? And that's Alfonso. At this point, no one really knows exactly where Green Warden went. Is that accurate? Green Warden is within 90 feet of here. You would probably see him from afar here. Okay. Because I haven't attacked anyone yet, and if I can help it, I'm not going to. I guess I'll try to distract them while Green Warden gets away. Why did you do this? This was a friend. He could have been invaluable to us. A friend? Yuli says. Did he not help us back up from the rubble? Did it not help us find treasure underground? You so willingly accept its charity, and then this is how you repay? It's dangerous. It seems the only one not worthy of the title of friendship is you. You can't be friends with a weapon. This is an ancient construct designed for military applications. And you're calling it a friend? So it's designed for a military... And that's as much conversation as can happen on your turn during a combat. Okay. Gallant is going to take a few steps towards where Warden ran, but not really run after with the intent to attack. Istvan's up. I will follow Gallant, but do nothing unless he tries some shit. I will yell back to the camp, You damn fools, you see what you've done? You drove off the only person who might know what's going on around here. Is that all you want to do in your turn? Unless Gallant does anything, I'm not trying any shit. Orlot is going to run in the direction of Warden, but is not coming anywhere close. We're back at the top of the order. Yuli's also going to run, and at this point, Rizian emerges from his tent and just kind of watches this whole scene go down. We're back to Warden. If I see them pursuing, I will keep moving 
and I'll take my full movement. I will use my action to dash. Okay, anything past the full movement, you're now going into the trees. Yeah, I mean, if I see them following after me, I don't necessarily want to hurt them, so I will just keep going until they give up chase. And now I will use one of these Sybris dashes and use Thunderlight Jaunt. You see I momentarily like lightning move in my direction. So I move another 90 feet. Another 90 feet? This round, yeah, total. Got it. 90 total. Yeah, and you are now fully into the jungle. Cool. Can I give like a perception check or something? Yeah, go ahead. Or nature? Why not both? Okay. So nature, that's an 11. Yeah, even on 11, you realize you are heading into the wilderness. It is pretty dark under this tree canopy. It is lightly obscured, and it is difficult terrain. The thunderlight dash would have ignored difficult terrain. And perception? That is an at one. Yeah, on an at one, the moment you step past this tree line, you no longer remember which direction you were running. You can't see the ruin anymore behind you. You can't see the campfire. I begin drawing my greatsword with the intention to cast a light and start looking around above me to see if I can still try and find the star. You can't see the sky at all. And that's it. With Warden gone, the Kundarak agents are no longer aggro. They're going to drop out of initiative and just sort of run to the tree line but not enter. What do you two want? If we're going to fall out of initiative, I'm going to walk around Gallant and figure out what their intentions are. Yeah, Gallant didn't pursue. Gallant was just watching the dwarves pursue. He was ready to jump into the combat, but then as soon as Warden bolted, he just stood his ground. I go up to these dwarves, and I chastise them. I'm going to do this in dwarvish. Ah, and I'm the one with no beard after that shameful display. What do you think you're doing? What do you think you're doing? What I'm doing? I've got some sense in my head. We're out here. In the middle of nowhere, with only that strange insect there for guidance, and we come across something. What can speak, what knows things, what's got some magical crystal with ancient dragon writings on it, and you're gonna scare it off? Yuli taps on the Kundarak badge on their chest. Have you forgotten why we're here? Or did you never know? I spit in the mud. I know why I'm here, but some small part of the idea that this expedition will yield profitable result is that we can actually return to Corvair. At that moment, Rizian is making his way towards you. What are you doing? After it! What are you standing here for? And he just walks right past them and goes right into the jungle. Orlot follows in right behind him, and Yuli will give you one more look, concluding the conversation, a uh, bewildered kind of look, and then follow behind as well. At the sight of Rizian making his way towards the tree line, Alfonso would have started to follow. All right, I look up at the sky. Can I still see the claw of Bahamut? Yes. Okay, I say to Alfonso, I think we know which way to head. Might give us an advantage. I think you are correct, but it will become much more difficult under these trees. Unless our friend is in danger, we should go. And I head off into the jungle. And I follow. Okay, so you enter into this jungle wilderness, the difficult terrain below your feet. Surroundings are lightly obscured from all of the leaves and vines and trees and as soon as you step in you can no longer see the ruins around you you also can't see anyone in front of you it's just the two of you surrounded by trees that is where we'll end our session well that was unexpected (laughs) you knew it was gonna happen the entire time Ah, uh, yes, that's that's my uh, sideways way of saying I told you so. I think even before we started game one, Scala was already on the notion of, well, the Green Warden can never meet civilization. <laughs> we'll get into that conversation more on the table talk this week. Yeah, we will. <laughs> yeah, we will. Pods in the Multiverse is produced by Jimmy Afadigato. That's me. And edited by Scala with music by Andy Berger and art by Alexa Riley. Thanks to our Patreon supporters, and a special thanks to our Holy Avengers, May, Jake, Chris, and John. For $5 a month on our Patreon, you can access every episode of Table Talk, our post-game recap show. Whenever we call each other's names, there is that likelihood that one of us waves at the camera, even though this is an audio-only medium. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. (laughs) And I will not reveal which of us just did that, but we all do it from time to time. Uh... 
and that's Jeffy, fine. I'm not going to shout out hi in the middle of uh, Jimmy's <laughs> post-game speech. But I will wave. I will wave. I have to be polite. We're, we live in a society, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> um, this kind of tomfoolery and buffoonery can be found on our table talks by subscribing to our Patreon. I mean, don't overpromise, Jeffy. Maybe tomfoolery. I don't know about buffoonery. Yeah, we can only do one. One per table talk. Anyway, we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening.